Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Disaster Related Fraud and Identity Theft Victimization, a webinar hosted by the National Identity Theft Victims Assistance Network, um, and additionally coordinated through the Victims' Rights Committee of the Financial Fraud Enforcement Task Force. I'm Mary O'Brien, and I'm Project Director of the National Network and your host on the call today. And just before we begin, um, I wanted to make a few notes just to point out that the ReadyTalk assistants are online and able to help you with any tech issues you might be encountering. So if for any reason um, you have audio problems or things cut out, anything like that, um, feel free to um, uh, either chat them or if you are disconnected, you can go to readytalk.com and, and get help in a variety of ways that will be on the website you can see there. Um, also, just so you know, the webinar will be recorded and it will be placed online. So feel free if you, if you have to leave the call for any reason, you can um, see it later online or share with your colleagues. If you really enjoy it so much, you want to pass it on. Uh, it will take us a few days, but um, by the end of the week we'll have it up there on our YouTube channel, um, which you can see the link there. Um, and then also we're going to use the chat feature uh, on the left-hand side of the screen, which you can feel free to test out if you'd like um, to uh, interact with the speakers because we will uh, probably have quite a few on the line. I think we have about 200 registered, so um, we will be using chat instead of, <laughs> instead of trying to speak live. Um, but feel free to ask your questions at any point during the webinar, and then I'll um, be reviewing them when we get to the Q&A session towards the end um, and sort of doling them out to the speakers from there. Um, but don't, don't uh, forget what you, what you want to ask. Go ahead and ask it whenever you feel free to um, do that. So. Um, before we begin, I uh, just wanted to briefly introduce our speakers for today's call, and then I'll tell you more about each of them before their portions of the call. Um, so just briefly, we're joined today by Hazel Heckers of the Colorado Bureau of Investigation, who also coordinates the Identity Theft Advocacy Network of Colorado, um, followed by John Rush, who is the Chief, De Deputy Chief for Strategy and Policy Fraud Section, uh, Criminal Division at the U.S. Department of Justice, and Sanford Coates, U.S. Attorney for the Western District of Oklahoma. And then we'll hear from Cheryl Zielinski, who is the Director of the Center for Bro Pro Bono, and Eugenia Pedley, who will wrap up our session today by talking about the resources she's developing um, through her work at the Office for Victims of Crime, where she focuses on uh, mass violence and international terrorism. Um, so the speakers will be covering the objectives you, you see here, starting with the first, which I'll be covering on the next slide. And, um, but before we begin, I'd like to take a brief snapshot um, from, from all of you on the line there so um, that the speakers can better understand your backgrounds and, and who's on the call and, and therefore what you might be looking for um, from them today. So in another second, a poll is going to appear on the screen, and you can go ahead and, and use it here. Um, let me know if you're having any trouble seeing that poll there. Good. We're getting some responses. It's working. Okay. Lots and lots of victim service professionals. Okay. Some law enforcement officers. All right. Just give you a few more seconds. Got about 75 responses. Let's see. Okay, um, you can keep responding, but I'm going to uh, skip to the results and show you there. Um, so a whole lot on the call here, victim service professionals, um, almost half, law enforcement officers, um, quite a few legal assistance providers, and then quite a few who um, identify as others. So, all right, and I could uh, see from, from your registrations that a lot of you from, were from all around the country um, in your emails. So I think we have a geographic um, diverse mix here. So on the call. Okay. Um, let's go to the next. So as I just mentioned briefly uh, when I started, this webinar is hosted by NITVAN, which is a national network that began several years ago with funding from the U.S. Department of Justice Office for Victims of Crime, which is uh, known as OVC. And I'm sure uh, with a lot of you being victim service professionals, you're, you're probably very familiar um, with most with OVC. Um, so if for many of you that, that are familiar with OVC, um, you might know about the Crime Victims Fund. 
This is a rather unique fund uh, that's paid by the fines and penalties of convicted federal offenders who actually, um, a lot of them are, are identity theft offenders and, and fraud. So um, this is uh, not coming from tax dollars. It's, it's really, in a lot of cases, coming from the very offenders to serve identity theft victims in this case um, who, who need that. So uh, it's an interesting, interesting model. And um, through OVC, millions of dollars, not just for identity theft, but millions of dollars um, for victim compensation and assistance of every kind um, in every U.S. state and territory are, are invested across the country. Um, for training, technical assistance, capacity building programs um, designed to enhance the service provider's ability uh, to support victims of crime. So as part of the National Identity Theft Network, eight statewide and two uh, regional coalitions formed a few years ago across the country. And the coalitions um, that you see here, you see their logos there, are um, engaged in creating and enhancing and delivering identity theft victim assistance training and outreach to improve the ability of the members of the coalition, the member agencies and organizations, to provide the direct victim services. And um, so as you can imagine, the, the groups are uh, geographically from all over um, and diverse, but they're also diverse in their identity theft focuses, which you might not immediately realize um, just from looking at this. Um, but each coalition is taking on unique challenges in their areas and also unique focuses um, from interfamilial identity theft, children, seniors, that sort of thing, to um, uh, unique challenges of low-income victims, domestic violence victims, um, and medical identity theft, um, just to sort of name a few. So um, you can see our, our um, identitytheftnetwork.org, and that will take you also to our Twitter and Facebook and that sort of thing. But there's a ton of uh, resources online, and, and I'd encourage you to just um, hop online and, and check them out. Um, you see here um, we have a training calendar, an event calendar, um, everything related to identity theft uh, we, that we kind of compile in one spot. We have a, a news feed which posts, and I just did a little snapshot here. You can see um, when Hurricane Sandy, we did a, a post after that and where you can find uh, legal information. Um, so we, we have the Facebook page and we post a lot of breaking things on there as well. Um, so it, as well as training materials, guides, and that sort of thing. And you can also get links to learn uh, about each of our uh, our member coalitions, so you can um, be able to contact them and find out more about what they're each doing. Uh, and then we also hold regular webinars like the one today, which are open to the public and, and feature national experts that we like to bring together for specific identity theft topics. Um, so ones we've done in the past that you can find on our YouTube channel as well. Um, senior identity theft, child, medical identity theft, lots of different topics. Um, and then one specific resource we have online that we really put a lot of love into was our um, resource map, which is a clickable map. Um, so you can find your state, um, be able to find victim resources, laws in your state that pertain to identity theft, uh, whether or not you have a mandatory police report law for victims, whether you have a passport law, all of these sorts of topics. We also have uh, quite extensive a tab called the Get Help tab, which is for victims of identity theft. You can direct victims to step-by-step uh, -step instructions recovering from various types of identity theft. So again, domestic violence situations, child, senior, etc. Um, lots of different types, and just walk them through step-by-step. -step. And also what lives there are forms, uh, self-help forms for victims who may be able to use those um, that walk the victim through the process of completing letters that they might need to resolve particular types of financial identity theft specifically. And this is kind of what that looks like. It, it, um, we, we link to, to these forms, which are um, currently now housed um, across the country in 21 states across the country. So your state might um, already have these forms hosted online, and if not, hopefully they will um, be coming soon. And uh, I won't get too much into that, but you can find out so much um, more um, online. And you can also, of course, contact us, and we'll, we'll have the contact information at the end. So. Um, and then finally, um, for, my, for my portion, I just wanted to give you a little teaser of resources to come. Um, the coalitions, along with the national network, uh, we're compiling an online toolkit, which is currently in development. and It will be soft launched at NCBC conference uh, in September, and then we hope to make it uh, available later in a finalized form um, in the fall. So we're going to have a lot of good things in there, um, downloadable, uh, you know, um, 
materials and things that you can use in your community, as well as a lot of how-tos and what worked and what didn't work so well and uh, what we've learned through the project. Uh, but just a lot of ways that you can, you can access this for a lot of different purposes. Um, so more will be online soon. Um, and with that, I'd just like to introduce our, our first speaker, Hazel Heckers, uh, who I mentioned is the coordinator of the Identity Theft Advocacy Network of Colorado and a victim advocate at the CBI, um, which is really unique in that uh, I believe it's the only one to, to host a 24-7 hotline for victims of identity theft. Um, and through working for years, Hazel uh, has years of experience helping identity theft victims and just has developed a wealth of experience, and I'm sure you'll, you'll see that. So I want to um, turn it over to you, Hazel. Thanks, Mary. Um, so you'll get to see here our two logos. The Colorado Bureau of Investigation is the host for the Identity Theft Advocacy Network of Colorado. And we have had a lot of experience in Colorado in dealing with disasters. Unfortunately, um, we have a fire season, a wildfire season, every summer that seems to bring with it not only major fires and some pretty extreme destruction, but also seems to bring out all the fraudsters and quite a few identity thieves. Um, people who follow the news in Colorado know that last year during the fires we made some arrests of some identity thieves and they were just recently sentenced to extremely long sentences, so we're pretty proud of being able to catch them. Um, one of the things that we have learned is that there are certain partners that we really need to engage. This is certainly not an exhaustive list, but these are people that really play a critical role in making sure that the community is educated about the potential for identity theft and financial fraud during and following disasters. So the media, especially the people who are investigative reporters, they have been fabulous at getting information out. Financial institutions are great at participating in making things easier for um, people when they're during the evacuations and during the times following the evacuation. Law enforcement officers are, of course, part of our first responders and are fabulous at not only getting information out prior to the disaster, but in being there during that disaster time. The Better Business Bureau has been a huge partner for us in getting information out and in being able to ensure that the charities that are popping up are vetted. And then we found that small locally owned businesses are also fabulous at being supportive as our local small chambers of commerce. Um, one of the things that we have determined is that you know, in Colorado a lot of our disasters are seasonal. We know when the fire season is coming. And because of that, we're able to do a little bit of planning in advance. Um, part of our evacuation planning that we talk about with people includes how to handle important documents that are in your home so that those important documents are not left behind when you evacuate to be there at the hands of identity thieves. So we talk about storing personal identifying information on flash drives, not on a computer. Um, when you do your taxes, to transfer those, that paperwork over to a flash drive and erase it from your computer because you may not be able to take your computer with you, but a flash drive can be tossed in a pocket or into a, an evacuation box. Our media, especially the investigative reporters, have been great about doing pre-evacuation stories about how to practice for evacuation, how to prepare for evacuation, and what to put in your evacuation boxes. And then our local fire and police departments have also helped quite a bit with that evacuation planning, including personal identifying information and potential um, things that are potential ID theft um, issues. We also have some great officers who know the community well. They know who the ID theft rings are that operate in their community. They know what the travelers and gypsies look like. They know the common scam artists. And they are sometimes able to stop the ID theft and the fraud before it starts. I think a perfect example of that was in the Black Forest fire recently, the Colorado Springs Department Police Department was able to identify a well-known identity theft ring that had moved in during the first day of the evacuations. And because they know them, because they know their community, well, they were able to stop these ID thieves before they were able to cause trouble and they just kind of ran them out of town. Um, they were able to find them um, at the evacuation areas with trucks going to people's homes offering to load up as much as 
of their stuff as possible and meet them at the evacuation center, or mingling in with the evacuees at the evacuation centers, or mingling in with the media. Um, so they were able to identify who those people were and to get them out before the problems even began. And I mean, that's what we all look for, is for someone who can do something um, preventive instead of reactive. Then one of the other things that is great and really helpful is being at those evacuation sites, educating people about things like Wi-Fi and if it's safe or not safe to use in particular areas, where they can go to get onto a safe computer to check their bank accounts or to contact their credit card companies. And I think that's really important in this world of you doing everything by your um, iPhone. <laughs> so it's really helpful to know what is safe and what isn't, and having professionals who are there at the evacuation sites, being able to talk with people about that really does help quite a bit. We've also been able to engage our partners in the financial industry, banks and credit unions, who are willing to do things like offer free safety deposit boxes to evacuees. We would like to think that when everybody is at an evacuation center or um, living in their campers or RVs in the Walmart parking lot, that everybody who's there is a really nice person. But we know that not to be the case. And we know that there are a lot of thefts from the shelters, and that there are quite a few um, you know, muggings and that sort of thing in the communities. And so having the banks and the credit unions offer free safety deposit boxes for people to put not only things like their jewelry, but to put things like their birth certificates and their social security cards and that important information. To have that in a safe place just lets them sleep a little bit better. And the good news for the bank and the credit union is that it establishes a relationship. Um, what we have found is that from a couple of years ago, the banks that did this now have a relationship with those individuals. So when another community is affected by a wildfire and they feel like they want to make a donation to a charity, instead of giving to the charity that just shows up on the Internet, they call that bank or they call that credit union and they ask, is this a legitimate charity? So they've established a relationship that not only helps the customer and helps the bank, but prevents fraud in the long run. Our Better Business Bureau is fabulous both before, during, and after the disasters and getting out fraud alerts, reminding people um, through the media that there are legitimate charities out there and that they can um, check that charity through the Better Business Bureau. They send out articles that can be posted online. They tweet. They do all sorts of things that help people know if they're on a trusted source and if, they, if this is somebody they can truly trust to give money to. Um, it's amazing to me the number of fraudulent charities that show up after a disaster, even during a disaster. And it's great to have the Better Business Bureau there to help people sort through that. You know, Twitter is here to stay, and it's you know kind of the big thing. Everybody, everybody tweets. And one of the things that we found during this year's fire season is that this was also an incredibly helpful way for us to get information out regarding the frauds that were showing up and regarding the scams, letting people know very quickly, very easily, don't trust somebody coming to your door offering to help you. Um, don't trust the, this person or that person. Don't trust this charity. Go here, do that. You know, we do have a lot of people who show up at the evacuation centers as volunteers who are really identity thieves or who are fraudsters. And um, Twitter has been a great way for law enforcement to get that information out. Um, the Better Business Bureau and media have been great about doing that too. And then using the hashtags has been a great way to make sure that people who are looking for uh, tweets that are about that particular disaster are able to find those. And then finally, we think that the coordinated response to the scams is kind of the best way to handle it. So not just sending out tweets or putting something on a Facebook page, or not just having law enforcement, or not just having the Better Business Bureau, but really having everybody acting together to get that information out and to get it out quickly, um, both through the traditional media and social media, um, making sure that law enforcement officers are getting the information out, and that law enforcement officers have the information about some of the fraudulent charities and things that are going on. Um, and we feel that working together has really allowed us to reduce the amount of identity theft and fraud in this year's disasters um, 
from what we were experiencing last year. So we're pretty pleased with the way that we were able to coordinate and hope that in the face of disaster, we're able to at least present, prevent another disaster from occurring. So thank you for your time, and I would be glad to respond to any questions that people have if you want to just chat them to me. <laughs> All right. Yeah, feel free to use chat, everyone. Um, this has been the quietest chat uh, <laughs> session I've had on one of these webinars yet, even though we do have quite a few people on the line. So feel free to use that. Um, okay, and then um, next up, and all of our all of our contact information will also be available at the um, on the last slide as well, which will be emailed to everyone. Um, so you can uh, contact Hazel and and talk one on one and get more more info if you'd like as well. Um, so next up, um, I'd like to introduce John Rush, um, who, uh, as I said before, is the Deputy uh, Chief for Strategy and Policy Fraud Section um, at the Criminal Division of U.S. Department of Justice, uh, where he leads and coordinates strategic enforcement and prevention initiatives on identity theft, uh, as well as mass marketing fraud, disaster fraud. Uh, and as Executive Director of the Department of Justice's Disaster Fraud Task Force, he oversees operations of the National Center for Disaster Fraud, which I'll let, you, I'll let him tell you uh, a lot more about. And John is also joined by Sanford Coates, who was nominated by President Obama to become United States Attorney for the Western District of Oklahoma in 2009. And then in 2007, Mr. Coates volunteered for a short-term assignment to the U.S. Attorney's Office in New Orleans as part of a special initiative by the Department of Justice following the um, Hurricane Katrina devastation to assist in the prosecution of violent firearm and, and drug crime and other, other crimes that were happening there. So he has quite a lot of experience in this topic, uh, particularly. Um, so I'll, I'll hand it over to you, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Um, I think we should begin by just giving uh, maybe a couple minutes of background with regard to the Department of Justice's Disaster for a Task Force. Uh, I'll then turn to Mr. Coates to let him talk uh, about some of the, the focus points that the Department of Justice has used uh, to pursue different kinds of disaster fraud and disaster related identity theft. And then I'll wind up our portion by talking a bit about our National Center for Disaster Fraud which has become a key resource um, not just for the Gulf Coast region, though it's based down in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, uh, but for law enforcement across the country. So let me say a word first about the Disaster Fraud Task Force. Back in 2005, although the Department of Justice uh, on a district-by-district -district basis with various U.S. attorneys uh, had prosecuted different kinds of disaster fraud schemes in the past, uh, the trio of hurricanes in 2005, uh, Katrina, Rita, and Wilma, uh, really impelled the department to recognize that given the scope and variety of fraud schemes that we are hearing about even at that time, that it was important to have a, a larger mechanism uh, to ensure close coordination among all the federal departments and agencies who deal with law enforcement issues uh, stemming from disasters uh, and also to provide an ongoing mechanism that helps us better to, to identify where new schemes may be emerging in response to particular disasters. Uh, originally, the task force was known as the Hurricane Katrina Fraud Task Force, but even in 2005, uh, the scope of the disasters you know, rapidly outran the original name. And then as time passed and more and more disasters of varying sizes across the country occurred, the department recognized that it was important not only to have a general mechanism to allow coordination among law enforcement agencies at all levels, but also to have a, a robust mechanism for the public to report on all kinds of disaster-related fraud, including identity theft, which links in with different kinds of disaster fraud schemes. So in part because of the work of the Disaster Fraud Task Force, I think it's fair to say that many U.S. attorneys' offices across the country, uh, including some who probably didn't even think that they would have responsibility for dealing with certain kinds of disaster fraud cases when they were so far outside the geographic range of particular disasters, uh, soon recognized that disaster fraud, including identity theft, uh, can maybe for obvious reasons become a national problem, uh, not only because uh, you have criminals in different parts of the country who may, as you heard uh, earlier from Hazel, uh, try to move into a particular disaster area from out of state, 
uh, but also because with the online availability of benefits uh, for various kinds of disaster victims, uh, that people can purport to be someone else in applying for emergency benefits, either from the federal government or from state uh, government or uh, even private sector relief agencies, uh, even though those people aren't in any way uh, or form entitled to the benefits they get. So let me stop there, uh, and I'll turn now to Mr. Coates to let him uh, talk for a bit about the department's focus on disaster-related identity theft and fraud. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you uh, today, and uh, I'll talk a few minutes about uh, DOJ and kind of what uh, has transpired here in the Western District uh, of Oklahoma. As everybody knows, I hope, uh, I'm sure that we were uh, uh, we had some serious uh, disasters here with um, tornadoes uh, in uh, the middle part and latter part of May. And uh, you know, as as most people do, um, I wanted to help. I uh, wanted our office to help. Uh, we worked with. Um, the uh, disaster fraud uh, center um, almost immediately within within uh, 24 hours we were in contact and uh, developed our plan as to how we were going to, to deal with this uh, it really was twofold um, and it's it's prevention and preparation and uh, uh, that's that's kind of how we saw it and uh, we were very pleased with the quick results um, quick responses that we received uh, uh, almost immediately after the uh, the tornadoes um, the and, and, and it often involves uh, identity theft um, and other uh, types of, of fraud whether it's charity fraud uh, government uh, program fraud um, or uh, you know simple frauds uh, having to do which with uh, debris removal or, or things like that um, immediately we were able to get uh, some billboards up around uh, central Oklahoma within a few days uh, we had electronic billboard billboards up um, warning people uh, about uh, disaster fraud and providing the disaster fraud hotline um, so folks that um, might uh, might have already been victims or uh, unfortunately might become victims would know uh, where to uh, where to go um, that, that that really served both purposes and and hopefully number one to to prevent uh, anyone that was thinking about uh, committing such fraud uh, from doing so and secondly uh, again to let uh, victims or potential victims know what to do uh, had they um, had they become victims um, the second uh, and, and almost immediate step was to set up uh, what we call our Economic Crimes, Crimes Task Force, and it, and it really um, mirrors in a lot of ways what was uh, presented in, uh, earlier in, in this uh, webinar. Um, we, had a, uh, we have an a, uh, Economic uh, Crime Task Force already established here. It's led by the United States Secret Service. Uh, it, it has most uh, federal uh, uh, agency has a representative. Uh, most of our local um, folks do as well, and um, we we decided we would uh, just tap into that task force there that does um, many identity theft cases and other types of, of fraud cases on a regular basis. And since the infrastructure was there, uh, we we asked them, and they of course agreed to be um, sort of our clearinghouse for um, for disaster fraud. The next step uh, we did was uh, put together a training um, that was last month. Uh, Jonathan came out uh, to Oklahoma City with others uh, to present to federal, state, and local law enforcement what types of schemes they might see, um, some investigative tips. Uh, we partnered with the um, Attorney General's Office of Oklahoma and with the District Attorney's Offices in the affected counties. And that really um, brought it to a head. Uh, and and got all the people in the room. We had over 100 people there uh, to teach them uh, exactly what uh, what they needed to know to have the tools to uh, to combat this when it when it does come in. And the last thing I'll, I'll talk about is media, and that's been referred to as well. And uh, uh, with help uh, from the uh, National Center, um, I did some um, personal media again to uh, try to prevent. Um, uh, the fraud from happening in the first place, and secondly, to uh, let victims know um, what they need to do if they had become victims. So uh, I was really pleased with the uh, quick results, um, the quick uh, res response times, and uh, uh, Jonathan and, and that, that group, I can only say good things. Um, unfortunately, uh, you know, hopefully people around the country won't have uh, disasters that they have to, to deal with, but when they do, I, I can just say that uh, there are structures in place to, to help immediately and uh, we've had uh, good results here.
Thank you. Thanks, Sandy. Um, before I move on to talk about the National Center for Disaster Fraud, let me just say, I think, uh, especially for those of you who are on the webinar, uh, who are from states that may not have had a recent major disaster, man-made or natural, uh, it's important, and I hope uh, Sandy's and Hazel's comments both are taken in this light, it's really important for the first responder community and others who deal with disaster assistance uh, not only have a plan in general for dealing with a disaster if one hits your community, but to work in what the law enforcement response is. Uh, unfortunately, as you've already been hearing, uh, the immediate aftermath of disasters involves not just trying to help people who are in often desperate circumstances, just trying to maintain public order, uh, try to keep uh, some measure of uh, uh, infrastructure up and running and you know, trying to do the necessary things for public safety. Uh, unfortunately, you know, those people who are in the business of being fraudsters uh, jump at the chance to take advantage of other people's misfortunes. And I, I can say that safely having seen many disasters, particularly since uh, 2005, where that's happened. And so it's important for law enforcement to know, as Hazel was describing it, if you're in a in a community that's particularly hard hit with a particular uh, regional disaster, part of your planning has to focus on not just maintaining public order, trying to deal with the immediate aftermath uh, for the victims in general, but knowing that there are likely going to be criminals trying to exploit others, uh, especially at their most vulnerable time. Uh, there are resources that are available uh, before a disaster like this occurs. Uh, where if you're from a state and you're trying to sort out, well, what should we be doing about this? I mean, Hazel's description of what's been done in Colorado is a really good example uh, of what can be done to bring in federal, state, and law, uh, local law enforcement. Sandy's description of what he's done in Oklahoma City, uh, particularly recently, is another good example where being aggressive and setting a tone early on that law enforcement is going to work together and adopting a zero tolerance policy with respect to fraud in the hard hit areas, uh, I think is a really important message, which does have to be followed up with some kind of a, a basic game plan to get people around the table and do the necessary planning and coordination. One of the things that prior to 2005 uh, had been lacking, and I'll just say uh, particularly at the federal level, was a mechanism that would allow the public to know that there is basically one-stop shopping for them to report any and every kind of fraud. Typically after previous disasters, uh, of course, people might call into the local police department, they might call the FBI, they might call one of the federal inspectors general or state attorneys general, and all those agencies of course would want to be responsive to particular callers, but one of the things that I think inadvertently was being missed was what would come from having a single point of entry, a single collection point that will allow law enforcement not only to be immediately responsive in taking complaints, but to make sure that those could be deconflicted with any other law enforcement investigations going on relating to those same people and finding an expeditious way of getting referrals out to the appropriate federal or state or local law enforcement agencies. So over time, the National Center for Disaster Fraud developed a unified approach based on what it had done after Hurricane Katrina when it brought together multiple federal enforcement agencies' hotlines to create a single intake point, a single call center operation to take in complaints. And so today, the National Center for Disaster Fraud, where I happen to be today, in fact, um, has a full-time uh, extended hours call center operation uh, where anybody who wants to report any kind of fraud or identity theft stemming from any kind of disaster uh, can call toll-free. Uh, you can also uh, fax information, you can email information, or write directly to the NCDF. Uh, as you'll see on the slides that are part of the, uh, the webinar, uh, the toll-free hotline is at 866-720-5721. The email is disaster at leo.gov, and the other information on faxing and writing is also available through the slide. 
one of the things we do stress with anybody who calls from anywhere in the country is that if they feel they need to make a report anonymously and confidentially, they can do so. We certainly find it helpful if we make a referral to law enforcement uh, that that law enforcement agency that gets the referral knows that there's a person who may have firsthand information about somebody else trying to commit fraud. Uh, we have had calls where the caller has said, I'm watching my neighbor deliberately damage his property because he wants to put in a claim for some kind of benefits. Or other people will provide information that clearly could only have been obtained because they're either a family member or somebody else close to the situation. Uh, and so we know it's important to be able to maintain confidentiality where that's appropriate. What we do, however, is to bring all that information in we ask for as much detail as the caller can provide, and then we have a deconfliction process where we'll check names against an existing database of other investigations that may be underway to see if that person is also under, under investigation by some other agency. And then we have a team of federal agencies here from the Postal Inspection Service, U.S. Secret Service, uh, Department of Homeland Security Inspector General, who review every one of those call reports that come in, and they will make, based on the information provided in that, the appropriate referrals to federal, state, and local law enforcement. Of course, a lot of the types of uh, fraud schemes we see are inherently federal in nature. If someone, for example, is engaging in identity theft, purporting to be a real victim of, let's say, the tornado in Oklahoma City, uh, that is something that obviously could be of interest to DHS Inspector General since they oversee FEMA's disbursement of disaster funds. It could also be of interest to the FBI. But we also saw, for example, with Hurricane Sandy, that there are various types of complaints that might come in from the public where state or local law enforcement would have inherently a significant interest depending on the nature of the scam or the nature of the identity theft being conducted. And so we have the capacity to reach out to all of the appropriate agencies uh, or, for that matter, to civil uh, investigative or civil uh, regulatory agencies like the Federal Trade Commission if that's the right place to send those types of referrals. Now, I'm stressing in my comments here that this is meant to be a resource for the general public. As Sandy Coates had described before, you know, we have uh, information that we could provide to a particular area uh, both in digital billboard format or standard poster format uh, that allows information to go up very quickly at disaster response centers, uh, at other places where there's likely to be lots of foot traffic in the immediate aftermath of a disaster. Uh, but if first responders, if police or sheriff's offices have information and they're trying to figure out what to do with something uh, obviously, apart from their own local contacts in their city or town or county, uh, we're happy to get calls from law enforcement as well if we can be helpful in steering them in the right direction or giving them suggestions on what can be done with the information they have. So the main thing I want to stress here is, um, as Sandy's comments should suggest, the department is really vigilant about this type of, of disaster fraud and disaster-related identity theft. Uh, we have had many reports that have come in both after the BP oil spill and after Hurricane Sandy that show that uh, many people are, are completely unscrupulous in appropriating other people's names or social security numbers in order to apply not just for one or two types of benefits, but potentially many payments of benefits to which they're not entitled. And obviously, if that means that a legitimate victim of a disaster is being deprived of the opportunity to get funds that he or she desperately needs, that makes it all the more important that we hear about that quickly and can make the necessary connections. Uh, obviously, you've heard also from Mary about the scope and variety of connections that are available uh, through NITVAN, uh, through its participating organizations. Uh, and to the extent the National Center for Disaster Fraud can help in steering people to the right legal or other resources to help people deal with problems like identity theft in the aftermath of a disaster, we're happy to help in that process as well. So I think that's as, as much as Sandy and I need to cover at this point, though we're happy to take any questions that may be sent in later on. So I'll turn it back to the moderator. Thanks, 
John, and thanks, Sandy. Um, if you don't mind, let me ask a few quick ones that relate specifically to this section, uh, and then I'll hold some others towards the, um, towards the very end. Um, just the first quick one. Um, are folks able to get this poster that we see here or others like it um, for free? Uh, is there a way to order this for their communities? Yes. Uh, very simply, if you call the disaster fraud hotline number that's there, that can be routed to the, uh, the staff of the NCDF, uh, and we can provide to any law enforcement agency or to other first responders uh, copies of the posters for free. Uh, we also have a miniature version of the posters in the form of business cards that can be left at police stations, at other high foot traffic areas. Uh, and you know, we certainly found from Hurricane Sandy in particular that it's important to be as broad as possible in disseminating the message, especially early on after a disaster. Uh, in some areas of the greater New York area, uh, we turn not just to police departments or to federal agencies, but even to the local fire departments or others who are part of the first responder community uh, because they could figure out better than we could coming from Washington uh, where those posters would do the most good, where you needed to get the message out the most quickly. Uh, so we're happy to provide that completely free of charge. Uh, when I say we provide those, we have literally, um, if I remember right from uh, Hurricane Sandy, when the New York Police Department said that they were willing to take these posters, uh, we sent hundreds of copies of posters and thousands of cards to them so that they could put, be put in police precincts all over the, uh, the city. So uh, pretty much any volume of posters or business cards that someone might need after a disaster, just call the toll-free number. Uh, we'll connect you to the right people, and we'll get that stuff shipped out very quickly. Great. We're getting a flurry of questions. This is, this is good. Um, so if you don't mind taking a few, few others before we move on that, that relate to this section. Um, what have we learned through our experience in Oklahoma, and, and granted that, um, that it, you know, it's still, still, still ongoing, um, and in areas affected by Sandy uh, and also previous disasters of late that will help uh, prevent or simplify investigations of identity theft in the, in the next disaster? Well, Sandy, do you want to start with what you've done through your task force? You know, it's a little early probably for us to talk. As you might imagine, those, uh, those are still being investigated. Um, so I'm not sure I'm going to be much help uh, on that specific topic. Okay. I think one of the things to, to focus on is, um, again, getting the number out early. Um, we have also, and uh, a lot of U.S. attorneys' offices have, have done this as well, when we have this kind of information available, uh, and I think this in part goes back to Hazel's earlier message and to, to Sandy's comments, the sooner that you can engage with the media, uh, it's important that you get the information about where people can call or email or whatever in reporting fraud uh, because I think the sooner that the community recognizes that somebody is looking out for and is interested in getting those kinds of reports, that's actually a very positive thing that you can do, regardless of what level of agency you're with or whether you're in law enforcement or in, uh, in other types of uh, community service. Uh, certainly, I think the sooner you get that message out, uh, while the information is fresh, uh, people are more inclined, I think, to report very quickly, uh, and as we've done with a number of disasters in the past, uh, if we bring even a few prosecutions that stem from a particular disaster fairly quickly after the disaster occurs, uh, that even if the, the actual amounts of those individual frauds are very small by comparison at the very beginning, that too sends a strong message in the community and we think actually helps to reinforce the idea that you know, it really is important for people to, to, to report this kind of information. Um, I think the other thing with regard to getting you know, clear and specific information uh, to the extent that law enforcement itself in a particular disaster region, uh, as Sandy was able to do quickly after uh, the tornado, bring everyone together and say, look, we all need to talk about this. This is a problem that's going to affect our community. The sooner you get those connections up, the sooner that everybody agrees, we're all part of this uh, response to, to criminal activity. Uh, that's trying to victimize our community, uh, that in itself is also a strong message that I think 
pays benefits in the long run for law enforcement. I think that's right, and I think one of the things I've I've been saying, and um, we're kind of used to it in the national security arena, but it's the, you know, if you see something, say something. I think sometimes people are embarrassed or um, don't know, uh, as Jonathan said, what to do with information. And, uh, you know, I've just been encouraging anybody that even thinks there might be a fraud uh, occurring or about to occur or has occurred to say something, let, let law enforcement deal with it. And, of course, if it's not, great. That means there's not been a victim. Uh, but so, certainly we can't investigate anything we don't know about. Yeah, that's a fair point. And I would just add, and this goes back, I think, to some of Hazel's comments about some of the criminals who will move in physically into a particular uh, disaster-affected area. You know, that's really where local law enforcement agencies are in the best position because of their intelligence, because of their tracking of, of activity with criminal groups in their area. Uh, it's you know, it's easy to say hard to do when you're also trying to cope with all the other immediate uh, problems in the aftermath of a disaster. Uh, but as I was suggesting before, the sooner that law enforcement says, hey, we've got to watch out for these types of criminal groups moving in, you know, you have your ears open, you know what kind of things to look for, um, you know, you know the kinds of scams that are most likely to be directed at a community when people are desperate for any kind of help and therefore more vulnerable to anybody who has a convincing line of, uh, uh, of patter. Uh, it's really important for law enforcement to send that strong message early and say, as Hazel was describing it, here are the critical things to watch out for. And where you can, spot the people who are trying to move into your community and take early action before they have a chance to victimize the community. But assume also that sooner or later, somebody in that community is going to start taking advantage of others through uh, identity theft and fraud to get benefits to which they're not entitled. And even though that won't occur on the first or second day necessarily after a disaster, that is one of the things as those reports start to come in where law enforcement could also uh, do a real service to the community by making sure that, that those kinds of reports are getting prompt attention. Great. Thank you, guys. Um, uh, another question. Um, is there a national database of legitimate charities? And I wanted to add um, my two cents, and if anybody um, has, has more or better, better links to send, I'll send um, in the chat window to everyone a link um, from the FTC, which is a great page I found on uh, making sure that a charity uh, is worthwhile and how to find out more about whether they're trustworthy. And that page has some links if you, if you scroll on down and read through it um, to better, your Better Business Bureau, um, uh, Wise Giving Alliance, Charity Navigator, Charity Watch, and GuideStar. Um, so there's ways to find out uh, there. And I'll send this link, but um, I'll also turn it over if anybody has um, a more direct or better link that they can think of um, for, to answer the question, is there a national database of legitimate charities? Uh, this is John Rush. I don't think there's such a thing as a universally endorsed uh, database of the type you're describing. Uh, the FTC resources are really good. Wise Giving Alliance has also provided a, a real public service by allowing people to check into these kinds of things. Uh, what we often tell people uh, from the public uh, who are wondering, well, you know, how should I decide who to give to? The quick advice that we would provide is uh, either pick nationally known charities that are already known and recognized around the country. That could be the American Red Cross, for example, the Salvation Army, both of which played uh, roles in the aftermath of Sandy. Uh, or if you need to you know, look at some other type of uh, disaster-specific uh, approach, you know, consider looking at what the media coverage is in the aftermath of disaster. And for example, with things like uh, Hurricane Katrina and so on, there were large uh, publicly created uh, charitable mechanisms like the, uh, the Bush-Clinton Fund uh, that clearly had highly reputable people uh, behind it. Uh, I think at the same time, we would advise people, if you don't know the people who are soliciting you for purported donations for the benefit of victims of a disaster, that may be you know, people who are well-intentioned but are not necessarily professional fundraisers or professional uh, disaster relief assistance, uh, and it could also be possibly fraud. So, you know, those of you who are thinking about, you know, what guidance to give to people who want to give donations, 
I think the easy choices are give to the biggest national organizations that already have an established track record. Uh, and if you want to take the time to do the research on particular organizations, then those resources like the FTC webpage or Wise Giving Alliance uh, provide a couple of different ways of giving you greater assurance that your money really will go where you intend it to go. Good. Um, okay, and then one more and then we'll move along. Uh, <laughs> What, what can victims expect from governmental entities that um, exist to take their complaint information and handle those complaints um, in terms of uh, follow-up? Um, so basically, in, in what way does a victim um, get to know what is being done with the information to prevent um, further victimization following the disaster? And what's the best way they could find out what's being done with that info? Okay. Um, let me be clear about this part of it. I think if People call the National Center for Disaster Fraud. We will take the complaint information. We will make sure if it has even just little bits of information that seem uh, like they have merit, we will refer that on to appropriate law enforcement agencies. Because of the volume of complaints that we get, uh, it's not uncommon for us to receive hundreds of calls and emails and other contacts in the course of any given week. We frankly do not promise uh, that we will get back to the person to say what the results were. Uh, we will tell people who, for example, have been apparently victims of identity theft in connection with a disaster, uh, we will try to steer them to appropriate other resources, uh, the FTC's web pages dealing with identity theft and a guide for those who are victims of identity theft uh, are really good resources. Uh, but again, I think particularly when we're dealing with a major disaster, uh, law enforcement is not going to promise to be able to give you periodic reports on what's happening with your complaint just because of the volume and, frankly, because if it looks like something that has real merit and it's then under criminal investigation, we may not be in a position to get back to a victim until charges have been brought against the person who engaged in that identity theft or fraud. Once, of course, I'm speaking here just at the federal level, though I'm sure there are counterpart uh, processes in various states across the country. Once we know that a particular individual or group of individuals has been indicted on disaster related fraud or identity theft charges, then we have a, not just a preference, we have an absolute legal obligation to notify victims of the scheme what has happened and we will stay in close touch with them as the, the, the process post indictment goes forward. Uh, and where it's appropriate, we can. Uh, take steps as part of the criminal prosecution process uh, to ensure that if the person is entitled to restitution, they get restitution, uh, or you know, in other ways, to be fully informed about what's happening with his or her case. So I think that's a quick overview of what's realistic to expect. Good, and I think it's an, it's always important for us in victim assistance to be able to be to prepare victims to know um, what uh, expectations. Um, you know, might be possible when they when they make various reports, and that can be uh, very frustrating if if the expectations are incongruous with um, the reality and that sort of thing. So it's good to know. Um, okay, well, there might be more questions to circle back um, for you two at the end, but um, I will uh, move right along to our next speaker. Uh, Cheryl Zelinsky uh, at the Center for Pro Bono, who is going to um, talk about what resources there are there to, to help make the connection um, to the legal community. And um, so this kind of takes a step um, further, uh, not just in the immediate aftermath, but also down the line and, and being able to uh, connect victims to attorneys that can help them, especially in those very difficult um, identity theft and fraud cases. Uh, so, um, and, and just, a, just a quick word about Cheryl. Um, she is the director of the Center for Pro Bono, which is part of the ABA's Standing Committee on Pro Bono and Public Service. And I'll let her talk a lot about the Center. But um, she's been with the Center for about 15 years and was previously a managing attorney and pro bono coordinator at Legal Services Organization um, in Michigan. So um, I'll let you take it from here, Cheryl. Thank you so much, and thank you for inviting me to be a part of this presentation today. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we can offer to those of you on the call in terms of supporting you in the event that you are interested in um, recruiting and utilizing pro bono attorneys 
to assist those persons who have already been affected um, by disaster fraud in pursuing legal remedies, um, specifically civil legal remedies. Um, the Center for Pro Bono is um, a, standing, a project of the Standing Committee on Pro Bono and Public Service, as Mary mentioned, and we provide technical assistance and support to those who are interested in developing or growing a pro bono program or project. Um, and we also work to encourage pro bono activity throughout the legal profession. Um, we do that through providing assistance over the telephone, um, by email, and through our website. I'll talk about a little bit of the resources on the website in just a moment. Um, but if you are interested in adding or growing a component of your program that is going to assist folks in pursuing civil legal remedies, and you're interested in doing that um, through volunteer attorneys, um, we are able to help you put together that program and manage it effectively so that your clients are getting the services that they need. Um, so the Center is a major project of the committee, and I already mentioned that we provide technical assistance and planning advice. We also have a number of publications, including the standards for civil pro bono programs um, that lays out the basic elements of an effective pro bono program. And that is a free publication available on our website. We have a national clearinghouse of approximately 4,000 documents uh, about a quarter of which are available for immediate download on the website. And you can search that through keyword searches. So if you're looking for a form to recruit attorneys, for example, we've got several of those in our clearinghouse, and several is probably an understatement. Um, if you're looking for intake forms, we've got those. You know, the clearinghouse is our resource library for you all so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You can just build off what other people have done. Um, in addition to the publications in the Clearinghouse that are both located on our website, um, we have a lot of substantive information on our website and blog. Um, so we're here to help you with all of your questions that you might have regarding a uh, pro bono project, um, from how do you recruit attorneys to the forms that you might need uh, to how to utilize technology to both recruit attorneys and deliver the services um, we can help you find training both for program staff um, and for your volunteers. Um, if you're looking for speakers on a particular topic, we are more than able and more than happy to connect you with speakers on appropriate areas. Um, anything that is involved with managing a pro bono project, um, that's what we're here for. That's what the ABA provides us for. Um, and we are here to do that at no charge to you. Um, so I do encourage you to contact me. Um, my contact information will be, of course, at the end of the slides. Um, but if you have any questions about pro bono after my presentation, I'm happy to take those questions. Um, right now I am showing our home page of our website and the address, which is abaprobono.org. Pretty easy to remember. Um, and our home page has a number of resources. Um, and the links to the other resources. So it's a great starting point if you're looking for information. Um, and right now we have information about the celebration of pro bono that happens in October, which if you are not participating in that, I encourage you to check that out. Um, but from the home page, you can go to pages that include information on pro bono policies. Um, so especially around the question of recruitment, some of this information can be very helpful. Um, we have a chart of the ABA Model Rule 6.1 and then the rules as adopted in the various states because they all have a little twist. They're not necessarily exactly the same as Model Rule 6.1. Um, so if you are interested in finding out what your state has as a rule and what the aspirational goal for attorneys in your state is in terms of providing pro bono services, you can find that information there. You can also find out whether your state offers CLE credit to attorneys for their pro bono participation um, and how much credit is offered for pro bono participation. Um, you can find out whether your state has a rule that permits attorneys not licensed in the jurisdiction to provide pro bono services. Um, generally, um, those rules will address retired attorneys, but sometimes they also address corporate attorneys. 
which then broadens the pool of attorneys that you have to recruit from for your volunteers. Other resources that we offer online um, are publications and substantive web pages that address specific topics, such as how to plan a recruitment campaign, um, how to manage your volunteers, and some of the questions that may arise um, in terms of managing volunteers. How do you provide appropriate opportunities, for example? How do you deal with a troublesome volunteer? Um, we also have more fun pages that address recognition and various ways that programs around the country recognize their volunteers for their contributions of time. And sometimes I will admit that our web page can be a little bit tricky to navigate. Um, so if you're looking for something on our website that you can't find, I encourage you to either email or contact me. Um, some of the other resources that we have available are links to other programs um, and some of the national resource centers uh, that exist that you might have interest in contacting. Um, we do post jobs for programs, so um, you can find out what jobs are available or if you are interested in posting a job for a pro bono manager within your organization to help you coordinate your pro bono efforts, we can do that. We also have information about training events. And for those of you who are interested in learning from your colleagues across the country, we have a number of listservs um, that you may join and share thoughts and ask questions and um, pose potential models that you want to try out and get feedback on those. Um, the information for subscribing to those listservs is on our website. Or if you just want to shoot me an email um, after you get the slides from this video with my contact information, um, I'm happy to add you to those listservs as well. So other resources that we offer, as I mentioned, the Center for Pro Bono Staff is always available to answer your questions. Um, in addition to myself, I have my colleagues Nora Maznavi and Bill Jones. Um, Bill specializes in um, technology in the delivery of pro bono legal services. Um, so especially if you have those kinds of questions, he would be the person to contact. And uh, I did mention the listservs already. They're up on the screen now. Um, and so I think that for the persons on this call, the two most interesting ones would probably be the general pro bono interest listserv and then the one for small pro bono programs, which we started um, so that programs with a small staff could discuss um, how to do the immense volumes of work that are required um, to meet pro bono needs uh, with just a few staff people and the challenges that are involved in that. Um, so those are listservs that you can join and discuss information with your colleagues. You can also connect with the Center for Pro Bono and the National Pro Bono Community online. Um, we do have a Facebook page and post events and general information about pro bono management on our Facebook page. We're also on Twitter, and we usually uh, tweet links to articles about pro bono and volunteer management, uh, what's new in the world of pro bono, and different um, changes in policies that are happening across the country. Great. Thanks, Cheryl. Um, and uh, I'll just uh, leave this up for one second before we move on so they can see that um, website. Um, and also, one of our NITVAN coalitions in particular has really focused quite a lot on recruiting pro bono attorneys and has, uh, to serve specifically identity theft victims and has specific um, sort of tips and information and, and what they did that they can share with, with folks that are interested in delving in uh, even deeper specifically on identity theft uh, pro bono service. And um, so I'll send this link um, right now to all of you on the chat in, in just a second um, to how to contact that, that uh, coordinator. Uh, it's the uh, Idaho Coalition Against Identity Theft. Uh, and Sunrise Ayers is the person there. And they, um, she actually presented with us um, at 
the, a recent Equal Justice Conference for those of you that are in the legal community on the call that would um, maybe be aware of, of those conferences. Um, and she could share with you a lot of the things that she um, presented there as well, and just as a wealth of information specifically on that. Um, so we, we did get a question that sort of pertains to this section specifically. Um, somebody who asked uh, about in, in, in rural communities, sort of there's challenges in recruiting lawyers and, and that sort of thing. Um, Cheryl, would you like to speak to some of the unique challenges in rural communities and how a person might be able to foster more relationship with lawyers uh, in those areas specifically? Sure. Um, rural communities are consistently a challenge. Um, there are, I know, a number of counties throughout the United States where there may be two attorneys in, located in a county, and one of them is the judge. So that leaves you one attorney to recruit from. Um, one of the other challenges, in addition to the uh, low numbers of attorneys in a lot of rural counties, um, is the fact that there's going to be a lot of conflicts of interest um, as attorneys um, are representing people in the community and therefore are unable to represent persons who would be opposing them. Um, and then lastly, those practices are, are small and tend to be living um, you know, fairly hand to mouth. And so it's difficult for those attorneys um, to justify giving their time at no pay um, when they need to make money to support themselves and their families. These elements all combine to create a really challenging environment in which to recruit attorneys. Um, and it's not impossible to do, um, but more and more programs that are serving rural communities are looking towards the larger communities in a state and trying to bring those resources that are in the larger communities out to the rural areas um, in order to both increase the volunteer pool that's available and avoid some of the other issues such as conflicts of interest. Um, so it's always... Um, a good idea to possibly partner with an entity that's located in a larger community and that may be already working with some of the larger law firms. Larger law firms sometimes meaning 10 attorneys instead of one. Um, it's also a good idea to partner with the State Bar Association and to identify any um, sections in the State Bar Association whose focus may be um, compatible with the kind of pro bono work that you're looking to have done for your clients. Um, with technology, it's really amazing. Um, you know, you can use, connect attorneys in large cities with rural communities through um, Skype at libraries or through online chats or email, and um, that seems to be really what's working the best right now. You can also um, try to involve law students where practice rules permit. Um, you do need supervision for law students, um, but they, can, they are usually very adept at technology and are looking for opportunities to volunteer and assist people. Um, and so they're, they've been um, involved in a number of pro bono efforts throughout the country that's bridging the gap between urban areas and rural areas. Great. Thanks, Cheryl. Okay. Um, see here. And I, I just sent a link um, to all, so you'll see that in your chat room um, of the person I mentioned. Um, and a few people said thanks um, for, for the info. That was good. Um, okay, um, let's head on to the next section. And if you have more questions for Cheryl, feel free to keep um, chatting them, and we'll, we'll come back again at the end. Um, so um, Ms. Pedley is, is, the program, is a program manager at the Office for Victims of Crime, OVC, uh, with a focus on mass violence and international terrorism. And she's been with OVC um, a little over a year. And then prior to that, she worked as an intelligence analyst with the FBI at headquarters. Um, so I'll let her take it away. Hi. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for having me here. And let me just say that, uh, yes, I did work at the FBI, but that was many years ago. I most recently came from the National Drug Intelligence Center and uh, joined uh, OVC last June. Um, anyway, I'd like to talk to you a little bit today about OVC's Mass Violence Lessons Learned Project. And OVC would like those that are involved in emergency response plans um, to insert uh, more victim-related issues into these plans. And the objective here is not to redo emergency plans, but to really heighten awareness of victim concerns regarding mass violence incidents. 
and we've hired a couple of consultants to lead this effort, and the principal product will be a modular online resource toolkit or an e-guide, and we actually hope to have that available um, online, obviously, uh, later this year. And we're going to be looking at the entire continuum of responses that begin in the immediate aftermath of an incident and go up to and through the criminal justice proceedings and long-term victim support. And really, to do this effectively, we have to look at the planning process and see how effective partnerships are also formed. Um, as far as what the toolkit will contain, one of the main things that will be in there are some checklists. And we hope that folks will use this in their planning efforts or feeling that as a resource following a mass casualty incident. And the checklist will suggest partnerships and actions before, during, and after a mass violence event. Um, from pre-planning, you know, through the crisis phase, as well as long-term criminal justice support. And some of the topics that we're going to cover in the checklist really include things like general planning and preparedness and recovery issues, as well as communication, both with victims and the media, um, victim assistance services, and of course, including in that will be information for victims of fraud, um, technology, partnerships and collaboration, and the criminal justice systems. And uh, for the toolkit itself, we're going to also address things like challenges and barriers and lessons learned and best practices. Um, also continuing with the toolkit there, what we really want to do is detail the cumulative knowledge and lessons learned and best practices from experts in the field. And we're going to be talking to about 100 such individuals, both from across the country and really across disciplines from this project. And we'd like to know what actions were helpful and perhaps just as importantly, which ones were not and why, uh, what obstacles were faced, and how successful partnerships were formed and plans developed. Because with our initial research, we've seen that that really is um, helpful for some of these incidents that have occurred. We're going to look at both the long and short term issues and discuss those in more detail and also talk about recommendations for things such as maybe how to do death notifications, um, cleaning and returning of personal effects, how to handle donations, including like the thousands of stuffed animals that might show up at impromptu memorials. You, you really can't just place those in the trash. Uh, suggestions for how to interact with the media. And we're also going to be looking at relevant case studies um, that are you know, so we can ground this project in real-world events and responses. As far as our audience, our principal target audience is really the VOC administrators and others that are involved in emergency victim planning and responses, such as law enforcement, state planners, civic and political leadership. But we really hope uh, that this will be useful to others as well. Um, and please understand that this uh, Mass Violence Lessons Learned project is really still in the researching and informational gathering phases. Uh, we have collected a great deal of information on many top topics related to victims' issues, but we've really only scratched the surface on the topic of fraud. Um, however, we do recognize that there are a multitude of fraud-related issues that arise after one of these types of events. And some of the more common concerns seem to be donation scams, particularly those that are associated with the Internet and often those that are associated with social media offers, and I use air quotes there, uh, to help with financial planning and bogus investment opportunities. Um, there's also the problem or potential problem of identity theft, which may be heightened um, because of the amount of personal information that could be publicized after one of these events. And actually, from our research and interactions to date, the issue that seems to be of most concern to victims are those Internet donation scams that deprive these people of the resources and funds that donors really intend for them to have. Um, just really a quick look on the Internet lists a multitude of sites that show how to set up donations and charities. Uh, for example, one of them says, you know, collect donations online, and you instantly receive each donation real time. You know, try it free. Another advertises using the Internet to raise money, you know, ask for donations. And certainly while some or many of these sites may be illegitimate, um, scammers can also use the same information to set up fraudulent donation sites. So people have to be wary. Um, before I get into a few helpful links, I'd like to pause for a minute and talk about the idea of a victim-centered response to victims who choose to contact a call center or complaint hotline. And one of the sub-goals of the Financial Fraud Enforcement Task Force, the Victims' Rights Committee, is really to identify um, and develop and promote victim-centered practices for use by federal victim complaint portals and toll-free numbers designed to take cons consumer complaints from fraud victims and ensure that they're victim-centered and responsive. 
Um, and using a victim-centered framework might look something like this. A uh, sensitive acknowledgement of the impact of the crime, for example, saying, I'm sorry this happened to you, and a thank you for the uh, victim's effort. Um, providing, predicting relevant information about what is being done with the information or the complaint. Um, and also, uh, uh, for example, maybe it will be used to help law enforcement start an investigation. Um, assisted referral to appropriate, trusted, useful sources, uh, one that's been checked in advance and that we know is current and operational before the referral is made. Um, and also uh, maybe something like preparing the victim for the next steps. You know, whatever the process is after the complaint has been taken, like the next steps are, you know, you may wish to check back, you may wish to contact somebody, um, others have found it useful to do X, Y, Z, that kind of thing. Um, using plain language, not legalese or government speak, um, limiting the use of acronyms, um, and follow up with a satisfaction email as to whether or not the complaint process was helpful or useful or worthwhile. You know, uh, would they, a victim feel comfortable doing this again and would they refer this to others? Uh, was the information timely and accurate? You know, things like that. Uh, Mary, um, I'm having a problem. My internet connection just disconnected. If you could hit the next slide for me, I'd appreciate it. Oh, sure. Yeah. All right. Thank you. <laughs> um, and uh, just real quick, if anybody else is having any trouble or um, having trouble hearing, just uh, let us know if you chat us or if you um, do get disconnected completely, feel free to um, get the ReadyTalk, uh, go to their home page and get some help um, because I think there was one other person having a little trouble hearing. It was going in and out right as you said that. So I okay. just wanted to check in okay. with everyone. But, sure. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> um, and finally, I'd like to touch on some websites that are dedicated to helping victims of fraud in a general sense. And these certainly apply to those who have experienced disaster-related fraud, you know, as well as victims of mass violence. And of, and of course, we've, we've heard some wonderful information um, from Hazel and Mr. S um, Stanford and Mr. Coates. Um, but this is kind of a, in a little bit different vein here. Um, anyway, one of these is StopFraud.gov, uh, the Financial Fraud Enforcement Task Force, and they maintain a wide list of resources and information dedicated to helping find and report suspected cases of financial fraud. Um, they have a section on how to protect yourself as well as related organizations and websites. Um, and that section has links to uh, the FBI, the National Fraud Information Center, um, the FTC that you mentioned, Mary, and there's an FTC site called Money Matters that's actually dedicated to consumers, you know, and other such links. Uh, StopFraud.gov also has resources for victims that has a searchable directory of online victim services, both in the U.S. and abroad, and that's actually an OVC link. Um, there's also the National Center for Victims of Crime and the National Organization for Victims Assistance, among others. And uh, the FBI also has a web page on scams and frauds and tips for avoiding common Internet frauds and schemes. And they also partner with the National White Collar Crime Center um, and the Internet Crime Complaint Center, which is known as IC3, so you see that in the link there. Victims can report an online scam by filing a complaint online with the Internet Crime Complaint Center, which is that link shown on the third bullet on the bottom of the page there. And while this information is fairly basic, it really should be able to help some individuals who find themselves victims of fraud after a mass casualty event or, quite frankly, any kind of fraud that we've talked about today. And uh, that's about it for me, and thank you. So, Mary, I'll toss it back to you. Thanks. Okay. We're going to um, circle back and answer uh, some questions that have come up along the way. Um, and really quickly, again, if, if anybody's still having trouble, let me know. I've um, just let uh, ReadyTalk know that a few of you were um, having a little issue. Um, so um, hopefully that will be that will be cleared up. Um, Okay, so um, first, uh, somebody had a, had a question about um, undocumented folks that might want to uh, report um, fraud or um, seek help um, from authorities. Um, can we discuss some of the challenges that might arise and what the procedures might be, uh, just starting with, with Hazel, if you could um, start, start us off with the answer on that? Sure. Um, sorry to be a little delayed there. I was actually responding to someone else's question so, um, <laughs> in the chat. Um, yes, I think 
in Colorado, and I can only speak for Colorado, um, our law enforcement agencies will take reports from someone regardless of their immigration status. So it doesn't matter if the person is documented or not. As far as taking the report, providing victim assistance, definitely, and then doing an investigation. The problem that we have run into in helping people who are in this country undocumented is that frequently we have to contact the home company country in order to get some documents replaced and to get some other information put together for that victim. And we often run into other countries that are not particularly cooperative in doing that. Some of their government agencies don't want to provide some information that we're requesting or tell the person to go to their local jurisdiction to get it, which would require that person to go back home. So there are some problems in getting the identity theft repaired, but in Colorado at least there should not be a problem in reporting it and in getting victim assistance. Great. Does anybody else want to um, add to that? Any of the other speakers? Okay. Thank you for calling. We will return to Sorry. your call. Um, okay. Ready talk was in to, to help a few people, so that might be why we heard that. Um, okay. And then um, Cheryl, we, we just listed a, a lot of websites there, and we had somebody asking, um, you know, it, a lot of times um, expressing that a lot of times there's, there's, there's so much information out there. There's so many links and so many websites that sometimes victims might be overwhelmed or not really sure where to go first and we, when we have all these resources, um, and asking if there's something very clear and um, uh, a one-stop shop that they can, they can go to for help. And I, I had uh, something to to offer um, myself, but um, first let me let me see what uh, if I could turn it over and see what it might be. It might already be answered by other other of the speakers. So let me turn it over to you first, Cheryl, if you if you want to take that one. Um, for general assistance, we do have a website called FindLegalHelp.org, which directs um, persons visiting that website to a variety of organizations that may be able to offer legal assistance from lawyer, re lawyer referral services to pro bono programs to legal aid programs. Um, so that's a good general starting point for folks. Um, there may be um, other sites that other speakers can offer that are specific to uh, fraud and especially fraud in connection with disasters. Right. Um, yeah, and, and feel free anybody to, to add to that in, in regards especially to disasters. Um, I would say a good general that, that some of you on the line might already know about, but in case you don't, a really good general, um, very easy resource if you're looking for a brochure or something you can hand to victims, um, as you were asking about there, is um, the, the FDC's Taking Charge booklet. Um, and I can send this, this link as well in the chat window. Um, but you can also just Google FTC Taking Charge. Um, they recently redesigned it within last year or so, uh, the, this uh, outreach material. And it's just super, super nice and easy to use. You can get uh, free copies. You can order in bulk for your agency to hand out to victims. And it's, so it's a very, very easy, nice way to do it. They also have uh, uh, cards, so easier, smaller, shorter uh, things, as well as a larger booklet that you can, you can pick from and all able to bulk order uh, for free. So uh, you can also cope. They do encourage you to co-brand, so you can put your police department or your um, a nonprofit logo on the back. And, and there, so there's co-branding options as well. Um, so I really like that. Uh, I think the new design is just lovely. Um, does anybody else have anything that they want to add to that, though? Okay, and I'll I'll send that link out too. Um, okay, and then somebody um, somebody asked, and Hazel, this this one um, I see you've answered this in the chat, but maybe for everybody's benefit, if if you want to um, also uh, say out loud, uh, take this one. Um, is there anything that can be done to protect yourself from becoming a victim of identity theft other than the costly monitoring of your credit reports? Yes, I think there are a lot of things that people can do to prevent themselves from being victims of identity theft. Um, one thing I would say, and this is not to put down those credit monitoring programs because I think that they can be very valuable and helpful to people, but what they do for you, you can do for yourself for free. It's just time consuming. And I think that a lot of people 
um, may believe that it has to be done by an agency when it really can be done by an individual. So um, understanding exactly what you're getting as a benefit from those people and then realizing you can do that yourself is great. But also to remember that credit monitoring does not prevent identity theft. It just notifies you early if you've been a victim of identity theft. So some prevention things, um, there are so many of them and we've got some great prevention checklists and some prevention tip sheets and they are free and we would be willing to send them out to anyone. And we also believe in co-branding so you can um, request that from me in a format that will allow you to put your own department's information on it instead of RCBI information and that way um, you can send it out as your own document to victims or to um, people in crime prevention programs or something like that. But there are some really simple steps that you can take in terms of just guarding your social security number, um, making sure that you check your medical history on a yearly basis the same way you would check your credit report. Actually checking your credit report, um, you can check it three times a year. Um, every 12 months you can get one of your credit reports. So if you go to one of the credit bureaus, and once and check it, then four months later to another one, and four months later to another one, you've done your own credit monitoring throughout the year. Um, just being really conscientious about what you carry with you and where you keep your personal identifying information. If you're someone who is retired military, and you have a military ID card that still includes your social security number as your military ID number, I would encourage you to go to the military base that's closest to you and have that replaced. Now the military no longer uses social security numbers. They now use a military ID number. Um, there's some tricks that you can do to get around the fact that your Medicare card probably has your social security number on it. Um, and I think, you know, while it may seem extreme, checking your driving history and your criminal history every once in a while is something else that people can do. And usually there's someone, uh, for those of you who are in Colorado, you can call me and I would be glad to help you make all of those checks to see what's going on. Um, but for others in other states, I'm sure that you can, that there is probably someone in the victim assistance field there that would be willing to assist as well. And I could help you find that person if you'd like to give me a call or send me an email. But there's just, there are so many things that you can do to prevent identity theft. Um, FTC has some great ideas on their website as well. Okay, and then re related to that, that question, uh, let's see here. Um, okay, um, asking about um, insurance plans um, for um, sort of um, helping folks with their identity theft stolen, um, reimbursement for time spent, etc. Um, so, yeah, um, on on that question, which is really related, I would um, recommend uh, we do have some information about this on our site um, in terms of you know um, it, it, when you're advising victims who who might want to who might you know after uh, something has happened might want to work on preventing uh, something happening again and might be um, you know, worried and thinking that they might need to buy a service or that sort of thing. Um, and you know, certainly for some people, that that's something that they uh, might want to do. Uh, but as Hazel said, I just sort of reiterate her point that a lot of the things people are not aware of that they that they can actually do for free, like checking your credit three times a year, and um, a lot of other really great things they can do. Um, so our job is, as as victim advocates um, and helping people prevent re-victimization can be educating them on a lot of those things. Um, and then they can make an informed decision if they would like to also purchase something or not. But um, for a lot of people that might not be necessary. So, And if I could just for just one second say something about those insurance policies. Um, people need to be extremely cautious when they're buying an identity theft insurance policy. Um, because some insurance policies for identity theft that do um, what they call repair, it's not as detailed as you would hope, and it's not the same as restoration. When you have um, insurance on your car and you get in a car accident, they, and your car is totaled, you can buy a new car with your insurance money. It's not quite the same with identity theft. So you need to be very, very cautious about reading the fine print and really understanding what it is that you're paying for. Sounds good, yeah. 
Um, and this question is for John and um, Sandy. Um, it comes from Kelly who says, uh, since Katrina, have there been any measures taken to be able to quickly check disaster benefits Your applicants? In just one moment. Excuse me. Um, to check um, disaster benefits uh, applicants' details before distributing aid, and if so, um, what are they? Um, so maybe the larger question to um, to speak towards the process of, of checking people out before they're applying for aid and that sort of thing. Um, what are some of the lessons we've we've learned since um, that hurricane? Well, I would say that immediately after Katrina, um, it was probably the least uh, consumer protective circumstance that we saw as a lot of the controls that uh, an agency like FEMA uh, might have had in place uh, in general for dealing with disbursement of uh, disaster related funds uh, were pretty much set to the side and the, the mantra became, especially after those first few days that everyone will remember when there was so much adverse publicity about the lack of federal response, uh, the mantra became, we just need to get money out the door as quickly as possible. Uh, and so the, the mindset tended to be, let's just help people, and even though there were uh, inspectors general and other agencies saying, well, we have to watch out for fraud too, I think there wasn't as much responsiveness as there is today uh, on the part of FEMA and other agencies. Um, I think that said, uh, the problem is with identity theft and disasters, very much like that for identity theft in other non-disaster scenarios. That is, uh, even if, uh, as you heard from Hazel, uh, you know, there's no guarantee that even if you're prudent and cautious in where you, uh, you place your own financial information and so on, that doesn't mean that somebody can't get access to your information. Uh, sadly, there are plenty of identity theft scenarios where somebody who knows you, somebody who you think you might trust, may take your name and identifying information uh, and if they're quicker off the mark than you are to apply for benefits in your name, uh, you may still end up in a situation, and this is one that we did, it, did hear about after the BP oil spill and we can continue to hear about this after Hurricane Sandy, people will report, I tried to apply for my benefits from FEMA and I was told, oh no, you already got your benefits. So the disadvantage for victims in that situation is they don't know who might have done that. Uh, and they will actually have to take steps with FEMA's appellate process to basically say, no, no, it wasn't me who got those benefits. And I'm the real John Rush, let's say, and here are my details. Uh, but unfortunately, even though I think a lot of agencies are much more sensitized to the need to watch out for fraud, uh, especially in the early going when things are still very much dislocated in various communities, uh, the criminal who is dedicated to trying to engage in a significant level of disaster-related fraud or identity theft can be very systematic about it and end up harming a lot of people very early on. Uh, so as with other types of identity theft, uh, you can assume that things are better than they had been uh, back at the time of Katrina, uh, but that in itself won't prevent uh, particular kinds of identity theft or fraud, especially for victims of the uh, disaster itself. Thanks, John. Um, are there any other comments that people, uh, speakers would like to make or questions that I might have missed in the chat window there that other speakers have would like to address? Um, and keep in mind too that you definitely can um, request more information later. Uh, you have the contact information up on your screen of the speakers. Uh, you can also contact me with additional questions, uh, especially specific questions about cases that you might uh, want a little uh, uh, more knowledge on and that sort of thing. Um, okay, I see. Let's see here. I see a few more questions. Um, okay. Um, okay, um, a statement from, from one of the participants under federal law um, uh, provides regarding restitution for identity theft in the case of an offense under sections, uh, and actually I will copy and paste this and send it to all. Um, so this is the restitution uh, federal law for um, uh, identity theft. Um, so um, speaking to the fact, uh, the value of the time reasonably spent by the victim in an attempt to remediate the intended or actual harm. Okay. Um, 
Which online symbols of secure sites truly are secure, and what qualities make them so secure? Um, I uh, wouldn't be the best to answer this question, but I know who would be, um, and I can send a link to the organization that would probably be a, a very good person to answer this, unless anybody else on the call has um, an answer about online symbols of secure sites. And uh, in terms, of, I'm, I'm guessing this question relates to giving after um, a disaster. Uh, this is John Rush. I think apart from the information that you can circulate, Mary, I mean one of the things to keep in mind is that uh, you always have to look even at those trusted symbols in relation to the site where you find them. Uh, as with other types of uh, HTML code, uh, criminals can take code that l appears to come from a trusted site, put it on their website, uh, and then that may make uh, prospective donors think that uh, this is a legitimate charity. Uh, so especially because a lot of these charity fraud schemes are very fast moving after a disaster, uh, it's possible that eventually the legitimate uh, trusted organization might find out that their symbol was misused. Uh, but it's another example of, of how the public still needs to be encouraged to look carefully and critically anytime they're looking at a site that is not a familiar, well-recognized charity. Uh, and here too, to, to highlight for the public in the very early going that uh, it's important to be careful about where you decide to, to donate your money, uh, even with the best of intentions, uh, criminals may try to divert it into their own pockets. So those types of, of trusted uh, logos can be a useful reference point, but they're not a guarantee in and of themselves. And you just have to look at everything uh, that's presented to you and decide whether this is a charity you think you can safely trust your money to. Okay. Um, now, there's a few more individual questions that we can answer um, a bit off the topic of um, disaster-related identity theft and fraud, but we can definitely, um, if you've got more of those, we love to hear them. <laughs> so this is, this is what we do. So we'd love to um, follow up with, with each of you on those. Uh, so we're going to um, conclude today. And like I said, feel free to contact us for more information. And I'd like to thank everyone for being part of the webinar, um, for caring enough to spend your time uh, addressing this issue today. And um, also to just let you know, future uh, NITVAN webinars will be posted online. So feel free to go to our website. There's a little box where you can join the listserv, and I'll post uh, information there when we have upcoming webinars and other topics related to identity theft. And uh, you can join that. And if you live in one of our states which do currently house an identity theft coalition, you could, might also be able to join a watch party um, to listen to upcoming webinars and also um, find out how you as a professional can join um, the coalition and attend their meetings and that sort of thing and uh, add to the effort if this webinar has excited you and made you want to, um, to do so. Um, so feel free to we'll, uh, be in touch with us. Thank you, everyone.